Heavenly Father, we thank you for our church family. United in Christ, we come to you in prayer and in worship. Amen. to see you. Welcome to the service.
Good morning and welcome to Moral Gospel this morning. Today is the day. This day, this moment, is the one we can live with God. He is present. Our sorrows over the past days we give to God, choosing not to remain in regret, but to learn from mistakes, failures, to live courageously in this day. Our fears for tomorrow we trust to our Lord Jesus, who reminds us to leave tomorrow's troubles for tomorrow. And we choose to live unafraid in this day, this moment, for our Father knows what we need, and it is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. I'm going to read a few verses from Psalm 112 to begin this morning. Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Their hearts are steady. They will not be afraid. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have distributed freely. They have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn is exalted in honor. Let's pray. Gracious and compassionate God, we have gathered today to acknowledge you to tell the truth about you and your kingdom. As we pray and sing and listen, align our hearts and lives with your kingdom so that our words of worship bear fruit in actions inspired by Jesus through your indwelling Holy Spirit. This we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
in this goodness of God, but this goodness also illuminates our hearts, revealing what is there. Hebrews 4, 12 to 16. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, But all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We come to the word, gracious Father, knowing that it may be challenging, but it is good and leads us into all goodness. And so, strong and gentle Jesus, we give you thanks that you feel along with us in our weaknesses. You too know the lure of temptations. You pray for us, advocate for us, and offer the perfect sacrifice of obedience on our behalf. Because you were tested but did not sin, we come to you with confidence. For here we know we will find mercy and grace for our time of need. We are in need of hope. And we keep hoping for that thing that just is out of reach. Teach us, Lord, to put our hope in you. Some of us, maybe many of us, need motivation. We need a reason to get up in the morning. We need something to look forward to in our work so that we can do that work with joy. We need joy. So Lord, teach us to find it again in relationship with you, in the little gifts you give us throughout the day. Help us to notice and delight in them. We need patience. We need patience with each other, with our circumstances. We need patience with ourselves. And to wait for your timing. We need healing. healing of emotions that have trapped us in despair or anger or discouragement. We need healing of mental illness. There are those among us who need healing of physical sickness and many in our world. We need healing for relationships.
As we think of all these things, we know that we need contentment. To discover the secret of being content in every circumstance, whether in plenty or in want. To know that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And Lord, we need leaders who govern with your wisdom. We long for the day when we may gather with your people once again and sing with full-throated joy. As we wait, prune from our lives what is not needed and prepare us for a fruit-bearing season once again. We surrender our wants and desires and listen for your invitation to true life. Speak to us now. We are listening. Amen. Good morning. We're glad to see that uh, Reverend Arvin Arden Thiessen is here this morning from Steinbach. He's going to bring us, we're blessed to have him bring our message this morning. And Mrs. Thiessen, uh, they motored in from, Winne from Steinbach today. We're grateful for that. And uh, I'm reading the text that uh, Mr. Thiessen has chosen is Mark chapter 10. And I'm starting with verse 17. It's entitled, The Rich Man. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit e eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, you must not cheat anyone, honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments ever since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told them. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will tre have treasure in heaven. Then follow me. At this the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, exclamation mark. This amazed them. But Jesus said again, Dear children, it's very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved? They asked. Thus far. So, we have no idea what the future will hold for us. The previous time I was here was in August, and uh, I had no idea what the next months would be like. We didn't know that in November, my wife and I would both be attacked by the COVID virus. We had a terrible month on November. I admit that I was horribly sick, 
dreadfully sick, but has passed, is behind us. We are well today, and we are thankful for that. When Pastor Jay called to ask me to preach here and gave me the text, I immediately thought back uh, to see what I had preached on this text before, because I've been at this for so long that I usually have something. All I found was that I preached on this text in 1968. That's over 50 years ago. Don't worry, I am not preaching that sermon today. This is the, this is the 2021 ver version of that. Anyway, and, and the sermon is gone anyway. I just found the date and the place and the title. And I called it then, What Will the Wages Be? Which doesn't sound to you like a sermon title, does it? Sounds like the type of thing you would ask when you're negotiating for a job at Walmart. But I use that title because Simon Peter once stood before Jesus and blurted out, Jesus, we've left everything. Now what are we going to get out of it? I'm wondering today, do you ever feel the same way? As you drive to work day after day at 7 a.m., what's in this for me? As you continue to love a spouse who seems to have no respect for you, as you pinch a little more on your household expenses so you'll have a little more for the poor, as you accept a role in the church which causes you headaches and keeps you awake at night and for which you never get a word of thanks, as you study for years at some dreary, boring university program, and it's worse this year than ever, to create a career for yourself which may be there when you're done and may not be there when you're done, and to add, to add to all that pessimism, I add a few lines from the English poet A. E. Houseman. A hundred years ago, he wrote, Yonder on the morning blink, the sun is up, and so must I. To wash and dress and eat and drink and look at things and talk and think and work. And God knows why. So, it seems to me we need the promise of some payoff at the end to give meaning to life now. Many years ago it dawned on me that one cannot li really live the Christian life the way it's meant to be lived unless we have a clear concept of how this life will culminate into the eternal life. And that thought grew and grew in me until I wrote a book about it, Welcome to Hope. You see, we need hope. We need hope because almost everything about life is undetermined. Who knows? When will the pandemic end? Who knows? What will the weather be like next Sunday? They're guessing about it. What kind of people will my children become? How long will I live? How fast will my retirement savings grow or decline? But every day we have to make decisions that are based on not what we know, but on what we expect. A financial advisor whom I read recently says, wrote about <clears throat> the importance of forward thinking. And that the biblical text that we have agrees with that little bit of wisdom. And to help you appreciate that little bit of wisdom, I want to explain two concepts that Christian people should keep in their mind. The first is the concept of deferred gratification. I understand that behavioral psychologists use it a lot. I think some youth pastors have learned to use that as well when they counsel youth who are going through temptations. Deferred gratification. The idea is that we need to deny ourselves some immediate satisfaction for the sake of some future reward. Makes for healthier living, they tell us. Most of the occupations at which we labor require this. Much of our giving and much of our child rearing requires it. And then there's the, the problem of myopia. Myopia is a, an eye problem, a vision problem. Some people have myopic eyes. They can only see what is nearby. What is farther away is always blurred. I think they call it nearsightedness if, in non-medical terms. I suggest 
that we all have a case of mental myopia. I won't call it a sin. It's just how we are. Immediate issues seem more important than matters in the distance. What is urgent seems more important than what is coming far away, from far away. And with those two ideas in mind, let's look at the text now, because this is supposed to be a sermon. Um, the text I have actually has three versions of it. The story of the, of the rich man is told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they agree quite closely, but each adds a few little details that help to fill the story. I'm going to walk through Mark's text, which has been read, and I meet all kinds of intriguing issues there that I have to just mention and then leave, because I must leave time for the crux of the lesson, which comes at the end. So, a certain man came to Jesus. The Gospels have no name for him. Neither of the three Gospels thought it important to say who he was. That's just a certain man. They all agree, all three agree, that the man was very rich. He had lots of property. Now, they don't tell us how a young man got all that property, so I can't even guess about it. I don't know how either. Luke adds that he was a ruler, which probably means that he was a leader of the local synagogue. In that context, it likely means that. Uh, Matthew says that he was young, and so we have developed the habit of talking of him as the rich young ruler, Mark says he ran up, suggesting he was in a hurry. He kneels before Jesus. That speaks of respect. He calls Jesus good teacher. Now that could be flattery. I've heard preachers who explain it that way. But uh, I think we might as well take it as being sincere. We could wonder how Je why Jesus scolded this man for calling him good. But I'm going to leave that. The man asks about eternal life, and that is strange. That's strange because the man had never read those two words, eternal life, in his holy scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. They are not there. Um, Jesus' response, oh, by the way, I should add that Jesus, in the Synoptic Gospels, never speaks about eternal life either, except when people come and ask him about it, happened twice, otherwise not. And you wonder now, now where did we then get this idea which is so important in our evangelical theology? Eternal life, we get it from the Gospel of John and from the Apostle Paul. Now we go back to Mark here. Uh, Jesus, Jesus reminds them of the commandments. How about them? And, the man said, and, and he mentioned six of them. I read one somewhere that Jewish people have identified 800 and some commandments in the Old Testament. Jesus mentioned six. And by the way, they all deal with interpersonal relationships. And the man says, you know, I've, I know them and I've done all of them. Sometimes preachers harp on this. They point out that this man was incredibly arrogant. They make that his major problem. But it seems to me Jesus takes his testimony at face value, and so will I. Matthew adds the question, I've done all this, what do I still lack? In other words, I see here, behind his facade of certainty, a deep sense of insecurity. Um, you know that feeling, don't you? Let's say you prepare a birthday party for your sister, and you, at the end, when you think you're ready, you look down the, your, your checklist, it's all there. But then it seems to you, now, what did I miss? That's how this man feels. He's done it all, but something, he's wondering, could I have missed something? Mark has a, a unique point at this, at this, at this point. Uh, he says, Jesus loved him. He's the only gospel that mentions that. Oh, and by the way, that's strange too, because it's the only time in the four Gospels that we read that Jesus specifically loves somebody. It's never mentioned otherwise. Why not? I suppose because Jesus just loved all the time, all the people. In fact, he was here in this world as the emissary of God's love for the world. It wasn't needed 
necessary to harp on it all the time. De Dennis Nineham, a British scholar whom I used 50 or 60 years ago, has an interesting idea about this. He says, yes, the word love is the common basic word for love, agapao, uh, but that was unnecessary to report. He says to this, maybe it means Jesus showed his love. In other words, maybe he gave him a hug. I like that. Uh, and hugging, by the way, was very much part of their cultural way of greeting each other, more, even more so than in our culture today. So I'll take it. Jesus gave him a hug before he slammed him with a sledgehammer. So the, Jesus said to him, fine. Now, in your goodness, you need to take a further step. Sell all the property you have, give it to the poor people in the community, and then come and follow me. And you will have treasure in heaven. You know, I used to think every time I read this passage that Jesus never answered the, the man's question. Yes, he does. This is the answer. You want eternal life? We'll do all this and you will have treasure in heaven. In other words, you will then have eternal life. It's answered for him. This demand has troubled people. Over and over we've read this and we've wondered, what does Jesus say to us with this? Does this mean that I cannot be a Christian if I own a house or a car or have a savings account? Some people have actually taken <clears throat> Jesus' words as literally as it sounds. I'm thinking specifically of Francis of Assisi in Italy who made a career out of being as poor as possible. And, 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 but preachers generally find a way of talking around it. They point out that this is a particular demand of one particular person. Don't try to make it fit everybody else. That's what they say. But the trouble with that excuse is this. In Luke chapter 14, verse 13, Luke says that Jesus said, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. That's pretty tough, which has led many of us to wonder something like this. Maybe I can give it all up mentally in my head. I can even go in prayer and say, God, all the stuff I have earned and saved and collected is all yours. And then say, okay, but thank you for putting me in charge of this. I'll be your steward, okay? And keep it and use it as your steward. Now, is that a valid idea? Or is that an excuse to evade the severity of Jesus' demand? Why don't you think about it or take it to your next Bible study meeting? Anyway, this good man turned his back on Jesus. Why? He was a good man, committed to obeying God. He respected Jesus. He treated his neighbors with altruistic kindness, but he was too rich. He did not understand the concept of deferred gratification. He had a bad case of spiritual myopia. He wanted the rewards of this life. He wanted them now, and he wanted to keep them. It wasn't that being rich was so bad, but that his irrevocable attachment to his wealth damned him, and he went away grieving. His aim had been to move up to eternal life, but he found out that the cost was too high. And Jesus let this good man go, this man whom he loved. And then he turned to the disciples and explained the obvious. It's very hard, very, very hard for rich people to enter the kingdom. Oh, I must explain here. When Jesus talks about joining the kingdom, entering the kingdom, he spoke about seeing the kingdom, he, or when he calls it the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, he uses all three terms. We must not think that he's talking about taking people to heaven. We use language like that when we explain to our children uh, what happened to grandmother when she died, you know. But when Jesus talked about joining the kingdom, he meant the kingdom that he was establishing on earth. You see, he came from heaven to start something new on earth, a new movement. He chose to call it the kingdom in keeping with the words of the Old Testament prophets. 
And he went about recruiting associates to join him in his earthly mission. He was inviting this young man to get rid of all the stuff that he had and come and join him in his task of establishing the kingdom of God here in this world. But it's hard for rich people to fit themselves into his kingdom plans. And to emphasize how hard it is, he used a startling example of the camel and the needle's eye. We understand that. Uh, it's too bad that some preachers try to talk around that and explain it away so that it loses its punch. Let's leave it as it is. I think that's what Jesus intended. Do you know a needle? You know what the size of the eye is? You know a camel stands here eight feet tall? The disciples are flabbergasted, which is exactly what Jesus intended. And they say, in that case, salvation is out of reach for everybody. And Jesus responds to that exclaim of despair with these words. He looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. And that helps us with a big problem that has bothered Bible readers. Um, Jesus', Jesus t dealings with this young man may sound as if it takes an awful lot of good works to join the kingdom. And so the, even the disciples wondered, who then can be saved? You know, it helps to go back to the previous paragraph. Pastor Jake preached on it last Sunday. There, the children come to Jesus or are brought to Jesus and the disciples don't like it. They tried to steer the children away and Jesus says, let them come. But because he says, to such as these, the kingdom of God belongs. Think about it. Here are children. They have done no work for God. They may, they may never have prayed for the kingdom. They don't understand the kingdom idea, but the kingdom of God is theirs. And then Jesus, go, Jesus goes on to say, Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of... Notice that. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child cannot enter it. The kingdom cannot be earned. It cannot be bought. You cannot graduate into it. It has to be received. It's God's gift to you. In other words, this man left not because he was too rich, <clears throat> but... He was so tied in with his wealth that he could not receive the gift that God was offering him. And Peter got the point. On this occasion, he did. Sometimes he seems pretty dumb in his interaction with Jesus. But here he sees it. He says, look, Jesus, we have left everything. What's in it for us? Uh, the last line is added by Matthew, by the way. And I want you to notice Jesus does not scold Peter for his materialistic way of thinking. He does not scold him for thinking of the now instead of the future. How will it pay off? And it's important that Jesus, that we notice the respect Jesus had, because the matter of eternal rewards uh, receives very little attention from the preachers that I hear. And the theological textbooks of this world have almost nothing to say about the future rewards for our serving here. I've, I've tried that. I've been in the biggest library in the world, I understand, the Bodleian Library in Oxford, England, and searched in their the old, old theology books for some clear teaching about the eternal rewards and didn't find it. We need to listen to Jesus because they say this pie-in-the-sky religion is an unholy, immature attempt to soften the rigors of this earthly life. Yes, but they say we can find all the satisfactions we need in our present fellowship with Jesus. Yes, but they say let's just follow Jesus and serve the people around us and let whatever will be, will be. Yes, but Yes, but this life rewards us far too unevenly and unfairly and inconsistently to be the full story of what God intends for his people. Yes, but Jesus once faced a group of anxious disciples who had the same questions we have, and he did not put them down. 
He did not say such thinking is unspiritual or unholy. Such thinking is un, uh, improper for a person who is committed to following me. He gave them a careful set of promises. Here they are. Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel or the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus is a realist. He could have said, uh, don't bother, just keep on working. He realizes that the question is sincere. The need is legitimate. We are humans, people of this time and of this world, and we cannot help thinking the way we need to think for living in this world. And to keep on following consistently, we need the assurance that it will be worthwhile. I was going to say it'll be worth a trip, but that sounds like a Steinbeck commercial, so, so I won't. It'll be worth a while for us to follow. You see, Jesus came from the eternal dimension to tell us in this world what the this worldly and the other worldly results will be of our discipleship. <clears throat> and Jesus understands far better than we ever can that every act of love, every self-denial for the sake of others, every service in the name of Jesus has its compensation, both here and in eternity. Uh, we've all heard the quotation of missionary Jim Elliot, who lost his life in Ecuador, who said at some point before he died, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So Jesus says there will be payback here. And I am sure the disciples heard his words and understood that he was talking figuratively. They were used to that. Jesus often spoke in figurative terms. Jesus spoke the way the prophets of the Old Testament spoke. Uh, and so I will not try to interpret what this means for them, about more mothers and more fathers and more children and so on. And I will not try to explain what this literally will mean for us in our life here. But I think we can hold on to the promise that what we gain in return for our serving and living is worth a hundred times more than what we give up. The next promise is there will be persecutions, which means that in order for us to keep our eye on the hope in the troubles of this earthly life, we have to fix our eyes on Jesus. He, call, he calls us to follow him because he himself lived the kind of life we are to imitate. He spent his days as a lowly, humble, unappreciated, unrewarded, basically unrecognized servant of God. And the earthly result of his resolute witness to the truth was what? They called him a blasphemer. They condemned him as a blasphemer. They nailed him to a cross and hung him up on a little hill there to die. The disciples thought, saw that and they were totally confused. But eventually they recognized it. They understood it. And once they understood what had happened there on that little hilltop, they were unstoppable. They preached the gospel regardless of what the earthly cost was. They carried on. And then there's the promise of eternal life. So at the end, he comes back to the question the rich young man asked. But that man never heard these words. He had left. But the disciples who huddled around, who stuck with Jesus, heard him say this. Which all means that the person who lives selfishly and makes sure that all her personal rights are honored may look like a success, but from heaven's viewpoint, that person is a failure. The New Testament insists that we can never live this life rightly until we understand that this life in this world is not the total story. Even if we follow our heavenly Lord, as you know, we serve him here in this world and at this time, 
But the ultimate consequences, the ultimate result of what we do here comes later in heaven. And it seems to me that this hope in heaven, in eternity, and the rewards of that era are too much overlooked in today's church. What you hear on radio and TV and most pulpits from ministers who may be evangelical or conservative or charismatic is that Jesus is the champion with whom you can be healthy and wealthy and powerful and successful. If Jesus backs you up, you will have a great and wonderful life right here. And then they say amen and the sermon is over. There's some truth in all this, but it's not the whole truth. And some wise men, maybe it was C.S. Lewis once said, if we take a half truth and make it the only truth, then it becomes a total error. So with this, when the earthly rewards seem to be far too elusive, and I think in most people's lives at some point it seems that way, there's just not much in it for me, then Jesus invites us to look forward and set our hope on the life of the eternal age. A few days ago, I read in Romans 8, the apostle Paul explains hope. He says, it means waiting with patience. I don't even think I used that line in my, the book I wrote about it. I'm sorry about that. That's a beautiful definition of hoping. We wait with patience. Without that kind of patient waiting, eagerness for service will die. Uh, the, the need to work at changes, uh, at the need to work at changing the bad things around us will seem unimportant. Perseverance becomes mere doggedness and the cost of loyalty begins to seem too high. And then Mark ends with the concluding formula that Jesus liked to use. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. I've wondered often when I've preached, how important is that line? Should I make something of it? Often I just leave it. But today, that line, I think, is very important. It's part of the lesson. It fits in. We have to accept that to see the whole picture properly. And I will let William Barclay, uh, a Scottish commentator who wrote these words about 60 years ago, answer or interpret that line for you. He says, there will be surprises at the final assessment. God's standards of judgment are not man's standards of judgment. By the way, he writes the way people spoke 60 years ago. But men and men. If for no other reason than that God sees into the hearts of men, there is a new world to redress the balance of the old. There is eternity to rebalance the misjudgments of this time. And it may be that those who were humble on earth will be great in heaven, and those who were great in this world will be humbled in the world to come. Well, with those words ringing in our ears, I invite you to bow with me for prayer. Our Father, we thank you first of all for your abundant, matchless, unending love, and thank you that you offer us and to everyone around us, the gift of the kingdom. We thank you, Father, for those who have seen it and understood it and have said yes. We pray for those for whom the whole kingdom idea with Jesus seems like a confusing mess and who hesitate. We pray that they will recognize that this is the right way to live out this life. Grant that they may also say yes to you. And we pray that the blessing of God may upon each one of us as we go about in this following week to serve the people, to meet the needs of people around us, to listen to God and to serve God. As we do that, may the assurance that it will be worth our while rest upon us. We thank you that we can live our lives with this comfort and this promise in our hearts. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavens.
Good morning of hearing the word, of being encouraged, of being challenged. I want to highlight just a few announcements that are for us this week. There is a baby shower being planned for Vicky, Tyson, Babalola, and Ezekiel. The date is going to be announced, but there is the opportunity to contribute to a group gift, so you can do that by dropping it off at the church office or by contacting Pam Dirksen. And the youth are having another virtual youth group night on February the 12th, so take note of that and contact Heidi if you'd like to be part of it. Pastor Paul has picked up on the theme of eternal priorities for this week's discipleship challenge, and he is encouraging us this week to be intentional in reaching out to someone who you think may be struggling and needs to be reminded that someone cares for them. It's been a long time since we've seen many, many people. And so I encourage you this week to, to just take a phone call, a text, or something to reach out to someone else and give them an encouraging word. And so I'd like to lead us in a closing prayer. Almighty God, by your command, time runs its course. Forgive our impatience, perfect our faith, and while we wait for the fulfillment of your promises, grant us to have a good hope because of your word, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you for 
joining us for this worship service. I pray that it has been a blessing to you. And if there's any way that we can help you further, encouraging you in your walk with God, don't hesitate to call the church office at 204-257-2500 or by sending us an email at info at moregospel.org.